usually I have to slam my my uh, shoe on the desk in order to get uh, silence, but uh, welcome everybody. I am very pleased to welcome here today uh, uh, Professor Petra Gude uh, as part of the Mershon Center Speaker Series for uh, her lecture, The Promise and Perils of a Politics of Peace, How the Report from Iron Mountain Exposed the Absurdity of Cold War Politics. I'm Jennifer Siegel. I'm a professor in the History Department and affiliated faculty here at the uh, Mershon Center. Uh, professor Good is an associate prof professor of history and the director of Temple University Center for the Humanities. Uh, she began her academic studies in Germany and then got her PhD from Northwestern uh, in history. Her research interests are in uh, the history of U.S. foreign relations, transnational history, cultural history, gender history. She's the author of GIs and Germans, Culture, Gender, and Foreign Relations, 1945 to 1949, uh, the co-editor of the Human Rights Revolution and International History, and the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of the Cold War. Uh, Professor Gooda is also right now currently completing a book manuscript on the global discourse on peace during the Cold War. Uh, please join me in welcoming Petra Gooda here to the Marshall Center. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the Mershon Center. Um, thank you to, to Stephen and, and Kyle, I don't know, for, for organizing uh, this and, and really taking great care of me uh, so far. It's such a pleasure to uh, finally make it to the Mershon Center. Uh, I have heard over the years so many great things about it. I know that great historians and great uh, scholars have come through here, so it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you. Um, uh, about my topic. Um, this, uh, what I'm talking about today is actually sort of the last chapter or part of the last chapter really uh, of the book manuscript which which I should have revised. I'm in the revision process about 12 months ago, 11 months ago. But then the school year interfered so I'm looking forward to three weeks from now and I'm back in it. But this was a good way to actually get back into, into the material. Um, so I actually want to uh, start out by just talking about um, this report. Um, sometime in the fall of 1967, a curious little book appeared in bookstores all across the nation. Um, the somewhat dry title betrayed its rather explosive uh, content. Um, um, in fact, actually, I was going to time myself. Um, do I have a clock here because I'm otherwise, I'll just keep going. Hopefully I will not over, overrun because I have a tendency to overrun. Um, so this, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, thanks. Um, so customers actually scooped up this book uh, pretty quickly. By Christmas it had landed on the New York Times bestseller list where it stayed until the spring. The book itself was shrouded in mystery. Um, nobody quite knew who the author was. No one knew where it came from. The only clue lay in the introduction written by the writer and political commentator Leonard C. Lewin. Um, here is the actual book. But Lewin provided few answers in his introduction. The book in question was entitled, as you see here, Report from Iron Mountain, a slim volume coming in just above 100 pages, and if Lewin was to be believed, he received a copy of the report sometime in 1967 from a, and here I quote, a professor at a large university in the Midwest working in one of the social sciences. Um, nothing further. That professor told him that he had been part of a secret commission that produced the report and that when it was finished, he was very much dismayed that uh, it had subsequently been suppressed by the government agency in charge. After months of agonizing, said professor decided that he no longer wanted to be part of that secrecy, and so he turned to Lewin uh, in an effort to get it published. Um, and of course, as, as you see here, Lewin obliged. And this is what uh, this professor, he was actually called John Doe in the, in the introduction, um, and his fellow committee members uh, were asked uh, to do. 
um, um, it was called the special study group. And so the mandate they were given was, was there were two mandates. One, to consider the problems involved in the contingency of a transition to a general condition of peace. And two, to recommend procedures for dealing with this contingency. Okay, so what would happen if peace breaks out, so to speak? They came up with a uh, recommendation, and this was the shocking part about the report, and this is why the government felt it had to keep it secret. They determined that war fills certain functions essential to the stability of our society. Until other ways of filling them are developed, the war system must be maintained and improved in effectiveness. What did that mean? Really, it meant that despite growing opposition to the war in Vietnam, this was 1967, and growing support for peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union, the U.S. government had no intention, apparently, of jumping on the peace train, and in fact was encouraged by this report to do the opposite, namely to keep the Cold War system going for as long as possible. So let me pause here, uh, and I... I, of course, most of you know that the report from Ein Mountain was a work of fiction, the fabrication of Leonard Lewin himself. He meant it as a satire about the absurdity of think tank thinking, but it was done so well, it hit the tone of a think tank report so accurately that he fooled quite a few people, even some in high political position. One of those seemed to be the economist and former Kennedy advisor, John Kenneth Galbraith. <laughs> Galbraith actually wrote a review of the book in the Washington Post, and he did so under a pseudonym, um, which made, fueled even more speculation um, of a, of a high-level government cover-up. Many even thought that Galbraith himself might have been the leaker. He further stoked speculation by writing that the report should not have been leaked to an unprepared, what he called an unprepared public, and that the document could not have been more credible had he himself written it. <laughs> he also then suggested other possible candidates for authorship, among them Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Presidential Advisor Walt Rostow, and the conservative political uh, commentator, operative, former Ambassador, uh, Congresswoman Claire Booth loose. Okay. Um, Lewin himself let the speculation fester until 1972. Um, and there's a reason why he came out as the author in 1972, because it was a moment when another leaked government document uh, stirred some speculation and revived memories of this one. And those were, those were of course, the Pentagon Papers leaked by Daniel Ellsberg. Um, and those papers showed, as you all know, that the Johnson administration had systematically misled Congress and the American people about the extent about escalating the war from Vietnam into neighboring Laos uh, and Cambodia. This leak was, of course, the beginning of the unraveling of the Nixon uh, presidency, not the subject of this talk today. But Lewin, at this point, felt compelled to comment that the reality of the Pentagon Papers was actually more absurd and bizarre than the fictional uh, report that he had produced four years earlier. Lewin was actually in the spotlight from the beginning, and he felt free to speak out about what he thought um, about the significance of the report. Uh, we actually have here, I, I posted some of the reviews, book reviews, some of them openly said in 67, 68 that of course it was a, uh, a hoax, but others were not so sure. So this is one, uh, this is one that's more cynical, books of the time, peace, it could be horrible. Um, and here's Lewin himself uh, addressing um, a, um, a book, uh, signing a book meeting and, and addressing uh, this particular book. Um, and this is what he said at the time. Um, um, regardless of, he did, at this point, he did not say that it was um, a hoax, that it was fake, but he said regardless of whether it is a hoax or not, he maintained that he had been given this report. Um, the report does reflect a kind of thinking used by some power politicians, academicians, and scientists. The essence of the book and this thinking is the abandonment of common sense and simple humanity and the perversion 
of our intellectual resources. We have been brainwashed into accepting a kind of Iron Mountain thinking that allows us to accept the mass murder of thousands of people in a faraway place as a natural condition of our world. So had Lewin made these comments just five or six years earlier, at best he would have been ignored and seen as a, as a nut, nutty person. At worst, he would have been dragged in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee and interrogated about his possible ties to the Communist uh, Party. But this was 1968, and the Cold War consensus was breaking down. In fact, the report itself, its satirical nature, served as a bellwether for the change in popular attitudes toward war and peace. To me, it perfectly captures this transformation of the international discourse on peace. The report was actually just one of a string of fictional treatments exposing Cold War absurdity. Uh, and I could have actually used uh, any one of them as sort of a foil for, for this talk. Um, those included books, of course, like George Orwell, 1984, which came out in 1949, if you remember. Uh, there's the, the Ministry of Peace that prepares for war. Everything is sort of turned upside down. There is then in 1961, uh, Joseph Heller's Catch-22, um, which also deals in sort of absurdity and coined the term really Catch-22. Uh, uh, and then uh, there is my all-time favorite, uh, the movie Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love uh, the Bomb. Um, these works of fiction, and there are, there are others uh, like it, exposed the absurd logic at the root of key Cold War strategies. Policies such as the nuclear arms race, uh, the, um, the ideology of mutually assured destruction, um, or the doomsday machine. Um, the doomsday machine was uh, actually the creation of Hermann Kahn uh, in his book, um, on thermonuclear war, which came out in, I think, uh, 60 or 61. This was an actual real think tank pro uh, product. Herman Kahn was the, uh, had founded the so-called Hudson Institute, and in his book on thermonuclear war, he actually played out the idea of what the world would look like if a nuclear war would break out. So, so really, Lewin is sort of doing the, the counterpoint to it. What would the world look like if peace broke out? Um, and in fact, Stanley Kubrick uh, had read on thermonuclear war, was intrigued by Kahn's theories, and used, of course, the doomsday machine in his, in his uh, movie. Um, so Cold War politics seemed locked in an impossible logic, much like Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Um, Cold Warriors could not pursue a policy of peace because the war system would collapse, and war was impossible because it would destroy all human civilization. Um, so they really found themselves in an, in an uh, impossible situation. So my argument, in short, is the following. These fictional accounts provide the cultural context in which the shift to a politics of peace eventually emerged. They were both a reflection of and driving force behind a dramatic shift in the transnational conversation about war and peace. Peace and anti-nuclear activists had been around since the late 40s, 50s, and they had challenged the Cold War logic from the outset. But it was after the Cuban Missile Crisis that their arguments began to get wider traction within the public sphere. And it was through these literary application, to the literary application of absurdism, and I mean here absurdism in the real philosophical sense, in the Kierkegaardian sense, and, and Camus, uh, um, there was sort of absurdity was, was becoming a philosophical and intellectual tradition in the 50s, um, or was a revival of that tradition, earlier tradition. It was through this literary, literary application of absurdism and satire that the deeply flawed logic behind the Cold War system was revealed. By mid-1960s, political leaders began to show signs of reacting to this change in public mood. Their tacit support for rapprochement um, and political engagement um, and politically engaged cultural producers and sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm messing up here. Um, their tacit support for rapprochement, I argue, came um, out of 
that fragile coalition among moderate peace advocates, creative politic, politically engaged cultural producers, and conservative Cold War politicians against the forces of extremism on the far right and far, far left. What emerged is what I call a politics of peace. So for the remainder of the call, talk, I will tease out some of the assumptions undergirding the report from Iron Mountain that give us a clue about the cultural assumptions regarding war and peace in the second half of the 1960s. And then I will show how the politics of peace was taking root in the international political discourse earlier in the decade, and certainly long before Nixon launched his policy of detente. In short, I argue here, and this is sort of a supp supplemental argument, uh, that detente, um, or I want to actually call it the politics of peace, did not represent a conservative response of Cold War leaders in the internal um, leaders to the internal challenges to their power, much like Sarah, Jeremy Suri has suggested, but a conscious adaptation of the rhetoric of peace, which had percolated upward from the grassroots level uh, of the early 1960s into the halls of government. Okay, so let me talk first about uh, what's in the or some of the aspects that are in in the report. It's a fascinating read. It's available on PDF form. If you have not looked at it, you, you should. It's really an interesting um, uh, document. But for the purposes of my talk, I want to focus here on three aspects of the report that make this document such a pointed cultural critique. The first is the way in which the report defines peace and war, or how, in, in its own word, the war uh, system. Okay. First, what is meant by peace? Um, and here's a quote directly from the report. Peace is a permanent or quasi-permanent condition entirely free from the national exercise or contemplation of any form of the organized social violence or threat of violence generally known as war. It implies total and general disarmament. It is not used to describe the more familiar condition of Cold War, armed peace, or other more respites or other more mere respites, long or short, from armed conflict. Nor is it used simply as a synonym for the political settlement of international differences. So peace, in short, was a tall order here. It was not merely the absence of war, but it had to be the absence of the threat of war. So this was difficult to, to accomplish. Now the war system. Um, the war system was, um, was the following. Um, and I found three quotes that sort of uh, exemplify this. War itself is the basic social system within which other secondary modes of social organization conflict or conspire. It is the system which has governed most human societies of record as it is today. Um, it is also um, made up of economic systems, political philosophies, and corporate juries which serve and extend the war system, not vice versa. Okay, so economics are there to serve the war system, not the other way around the war system serves um, 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 the economy. And finally, the precedence of a society's war making potential over its other characteristics is not the result of the threat presumed to exist at any one time from other societies. This is the reverse of the basic situation. Threats against the national interest are usually created or accelerated to meet the changing needs of the war system. So everything is organized around the war system. Okay. War, in other words, was no longer the continuation of politics by other means, as Clausewitz had stated, but instead the core of social organization. And it determines all other functions of the state. This sounds crazy, right? Sounds completely absurd. But we have historians who actually talked about the militarization of American society. Michael Sherry has proven that American society was very much militarized. Um, Michael Hogan has written about the garrison state. So what this report did was it took those real existing pressures and took them to the logical extreme and made them sound absurd. So the second aspect relates to the economics of war and peace. Here the report argued that the current war system fulfilled an important economic function 
which, which would be obliterated if peace and total disarmament were to arrive. This, again, is also based in some real argument. Uh, remember uh, Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex. The report took for granted the nation's dependence on this vast defense industry and, again, took that to its logical extreme. The nation's dependence on this, uh, the, the war system had to be maintained in order to maintain this military-industrial complex to stave off massive unemployment and an economic downturn. And there actually existed a report by an economic think tank published in 1965 that calculated precisely the impact of disarmament on various industries and regions in the country. And it predicted a significant decrease in output on some industries. Obviously, the most uh, uh, prominent one was a 16% decrease in output and employment in the aircraft industry. So even though the report from Iron Mountain was fictional, government agencies and think tanks by the mid-1960s were actually pondering some of the same kinds of questions. And the report itself added to its legitimacy by quoting some of these actual reports. Okay. So there are multiple layers here. Um, the third aspect I want to highlight uh, refers to the war system's function as social stabilizer. Here the report played with the notion that the military served as an institutional, um, um, served, served as an institution that provided so-called antisocial elements, that's in the report, within society with an acceptable outlet, with an acceptable social role. In other words, the war system had found a way to park and control juvenile delinquents, petty criminals, and so on and so forth. If that function disappeared, where would these people go? Where would society, what would society do with them? Would there be national unrest? Would there be higher crime? If peace were to break out, the government would have to find alternative outlets for what it called these destabilizing social elements. And it offered some possibilities. Some were fairly mild. Uh, for instance, um, I will actually spare you the little paragraph, the two paragraphs on the history of blood sacrifice, how killing actually was part of any kind of society and therefore war served that kind of social function and move right into programs to uh, deal, deal with these destabilizing social elements. It suggested a uh, ex expanded Peace Corps as one possibility. Uh, it, it, it suggested a so-called job score, job Corps along the lines of the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, in, the, in the New Deal period, but one that mirrored the discipline of the armed forces. A kind of, and here again I quote from the report, unarmed forces. Perhaps the most outrageous, I think it is the most outrageous proposal, was the suggestion to reintroduce some form of slavery as a way to control delinquents a function that military service had traditionally uh, fulfilled. This was, of course, utterly outrageous, but again, we need to examine the hidden premises um, of this suggestion. By the 1960s, the American military had changed uh, quite significantly. It was no longer a representative cross-section of the American male population. It had a higher proportion of working class men, a higher proportion of minorities, and uh, a higher portion of uh, people with lower, um, e with lower educational level. And with the draft, military service had a compuls already a compulsory element that uh, shared some elements with the system of slavery. In short, the report played with the real public perception that military service fulfilled a function for young men whose economic uh, and social prospects were otherwise limited, and again, took it to its extremes. Lewin himself uh, later uh, weighed in on these issues um, and said he wanted to, and I quote him here, to pose the issue of war and peace in a provocative way, to deal with the essential absurdity of the fact that the war system, however much deplored, is ne nevertheless accepted as part of the necessary order of things, to caricature the bankruptcy of the think tank mentality by pursuing its style of scientific thinking 
to its logical end, and perhaps with luck to extend the scope of public discussion of peace planning beyond its usual stodgy limits. And in that he succeeded quite well. There were countless articles, reviews, and discussions about war and peace in the aftermath of its publication. Um, and so there was a, um, a big discussion emerging. It is harder to determine whether the public conversation changed in response to the book or whether the book brought to national and international attention a conversation that was already taking place in the public uh, arena. Most likely it was a combination of, of the two. Um, so let's look at how this kind of absurdist literature uh, production played out in the political realm of Cold War politics in the 1960s. To be clear, I don't want to argue um, a case here of direct um, causation. I don't want to argue that this book caused uh, politicians to reconsider their attitudes um, toward uh, peace in the United States. Um, rather, I want to look at the cultural context. Um, this is not a question of causation, but one of cultural environment. It is also about the reciprocity between culture and politics. In other words, it is about how cultural production helped break down political taboos and how political ideas that were once deemed outside the realm of acceptability were made visible and eventually uh, possible through their treatment in the cultural domain. Publications like the report from Iron Mountain moved peace from the margins to the center of the international political discourse. By the same token, this absurdist literature made acceptable to a broader public a more cooperative peace politics that was already being articulated on the fringes of the political establishment. It challenged cold warriors to defend a political position that looked increasingly irrational. And those were the realists who looked increasingly irrational. By treating the nuclear arms race, war, and peace as satirical subjects, these cultural opinion molders succeeded in restoring it as a serious subject of political discourse. So through absurdity, you get back some of the sanity in the argument. Um, they helped popularize the broader contours of a transnational conversation that questioned established Cold War policy assumptions. So they both reflected and fueled the, pop the current popular frustration with Cold War rhetoric and helped lay the groundwork for the ultimate acceptance of a politics of peace. So until the 1960s, transnational peace politics was practiced by those on the political margins, uh, the anti-nuclear activists, the pacifists, the anti-war activists. And I'm actually using pacifists and anti-war activists as two separate groups because they really are not uh, they're really not the same. Um, they're two different constituencies. They were on the margins. They were usually, um, they, nobody paid much attention to them until the middle of the 1960s. Um, among those to the cl closer to the center of power, few embraced an outright peace platform. One of those who did was Willy Brandt, leading member of the West German Social Democratic Party and mayor of West Berlin uh, during the Berlin crisis of 1961. He was among the earliest proponents of a politics of peace in the Western camp. Um, Brandt, in fact, was deeply affected by the building uh, of the Berlin Wall in 1961. As mayor of Berlin, at the time, he felt utterly powerless as the two superpowers worked out a deal between them that kept the peace, which was important to Brunt, to everybody, but came at great cost to the citizens of Berlin. And it was this experience of powerlessness that prompted him to rethink some of the core assumptions of the Cold War. Together uh, with his uh, close political ally uh, and advisor, Egon Barr, um, he developed a foreign policy program that he called um, Wandel durch Annäherung or uh, Change through Rapprochement. He did this in the early 1960s, really in the immediate aftermath of the, of the Berlin uh, Wall crisis, a moment where we do not talk yet about detente uh, at all. 
Um, as mayor of Berlin, of course, Brandt had no business dealing in foreign policy. Uh, he had no power um, to speak of. In fact, he was, he was a leading member of the Social Democratic Party. Um, it was in those days until the end of the Cold War, uh, being mayor of Berlin was actually seen as a stepping stone to becoming uh, active in national politics. Um, so it was clear that he was headed for, uh, for national office. But as mayor of Berlin, he had, no, he had no power, he had no leverage, and his party had no leverage. It had been in the opposition since the founding of the Federal Republic in 1949, um, an old, um, old cranky, um, conservative Konrad Adenauer was in power. I think he was by 61. He was like 97 years old. He, he was old. Um, not quite that old, but he, I think he became chancellor in 1949 at age 70, 74. And we know sometimes old, old heads of state can... Well, anyway. <laughs> um, so Barr actually, um, his aide, Egon Barr, actually first articulated this vision in public at a speech in 1963, and it caused an uproar um, because it actually upended um, the entire foundation of Ger West Germany's foreign, uh, Cold War foreign policy. Um, and this uh, foreign policy was based on something called the Hallstein Doctrine, which was developed in 1955 when Germany actually achieved full sovereignty. This doctrine stated that West Germany would establish formal diplomatic relations only with countries that did not recognize East Germany. Um, so it, it made a real effort to isolate East Germany um, and therefore countries had to choose to either develop diplomatic relations with East Germany and the communist bloc or with West Germany and the West. Um, so whatever office Brandt occupied, whether as mayor of Berlin, as foreign minister later, or eventually he made it to the chancellorship. He tried and did implement this policy of change through rapprochement. It started, um, um, interestingly, while he was mayor uh, and he negotiated a, an agreement about easier passage between East and West Berlin, uh, basically making the wall a little more uh, porous. Then in 1966, as foreign minister, he advocated the establishing, uh, advocated um, um, establishing relations uh, with Yugoslavia and Romania. Um, he also negotiated uh, the exchange of trade representatives with other East European countries. And all of these m measures actually nibbled away at the edges of the Hallstein Doctrine. Um, it, they did all sorts of diplomatic relations without the establishment of an actual diplomatic representation, okay? So then when he uh, finally became chancellor in 1961, 69, he immediately went to work on uh, what then became known as uh, Ostpolitik, um, which was a series of treaties that guaranteed the existing border with uh, Poland, established formal relations uh, finally with East Germany, even though they were still not called ambassadors, uh, they were called permanent representatives. Uh, but it really um, um, ended the Hallstein Doctrine uh, and moved East Germany out of diplomatic uh, isolation. Um, Brandt built his politics um, of peace from the ground up, starting at the local level in Berlin and finally implementing it at, uh, on an international level in 1971. So while Brandt, as a political figure, was a political figure that helped shape the transnational politics of peace and the transnational debate in favor of peace. Nixon, on the other hand, was someone who adapted to it after he sensed its popularity. Um, by the time Nixon uh, ran uh, for uh, president in 1968, the anti-war movement was at its height and popular opinion had turned squarely in favor of peace with Vietnam. Um, there's a new biography out uh, on Nixon, I have actually not looked at it, but in recent months, news um, did um, um, one, one, I think it was, it was Farrell who, who uncovered it, uh, that there's finally proof now that Nixon did interfere directly um, to 
uh, undermine peace efforts of the Johnson administration uh, and try to prevent a peace agreement from, from happening. Um, this does not necessarily mean that uh, he was anti-peace. He just did not want uh, the Johnson administration to get the credit for it. Um, he uh, ran on a platform of peace in Vietnam. He had the secret plan. Um, and once in office, peace politics really became a central theme in the Nixon, uh, in the Nixon White House. Um, despite, or some would argue, because of his reputation as a hawk in international diplomacy. Um, of course, we all know about the milestones uh, that gave him the label of, the, of, of, if not a peace president, but at least someone uh, uh, involved in detente. This was the visit to China in February 1972. Uh, followed by a visit to Moscow in May 1972, where he uh, signed um, the Strategic Arms Limitation and Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaties, uh, then followed in 1973 by finally the Paris Peace Accords ending America's involvement in Vietnam. Um, of course, and I don't have a slide with the war tally uh, because he was as much involved in military actions, overt and covert, during this time um, that are seen as a counterweight. But these accomplishments um, really did form a cornerstone of his policy of uh, detente. But as significant as these accomplishments were, they were not as much of a radical uh, departure as generally assumed. Uh, rather, and this is the important part of my argument here, they were the culmination of the transnational peace politics that had been in the making since 1962. And so once we look globally and internationally, transnationally, we see that those pieces were in place in the, in the early um, 1960s. Um, and I want to stress here that when looking, putting Brandt and Nixon side by side their, poli their peace politics. Um, they were not, it's clear here that they were not, they could not have been uh, born out of a desire to quell domestic opposition. Um, neither Brunt nor Nixon fit neatly into the conventional political camps at the time. Nixon was a staunch conservative, Brunt a social democrat, a socialist really. Yet both acknowledged the popular desire for peace and acted on it within the context of their own diametrically opposed political convictions. So they met in the center in a peace politics coming from opposite sides of the political spectrum. So we were earlier talking about digital scholarship um, and digital humanities. Um, and I have to say I'm not well versed in this, but I have to say that um, digital archives really help me a lot and help us a lot in doing our research. So one simple thing I did was actually put into a search engine of articles and speeches of Nixon the word peace. Um, peace and Nixon in combination is actually quite ubiquitous. Um, and this is how I found that regardless of what his personal views were, were um, he used and I would say overused the term peace whenever uh, he could. Um, for instance, um, he, Nixon was the first to actually produce yearly reports to Congress on his foreign policies. Um, and so here are, um, oh, first I want to talk about his, his uh, inaugural address um, in 1969. Of course, with the caveat that inaugural addresses are always sort of grand, idealistic um, statements. Um, but still, it is amazing how often he invoked the term peace. So I have three examples here. Um, for the first time, this is from his inaugural address, because the people of the world want peace and the leaders of the world are afraid of war, the times are on the side of peace. He wanted to turn uh, America into a peacemaker in the world. Um, this is the hawk, Nixon. And let us take as our goal, where peace is unknown, make it welcome, where peace is fragile, make it strong, where peace is temporary, make it permanent. After a period of confrontation, we are entering an era of negotiation. Um, so in some ways, 
at least rhetorically, uh, he was very much saw himself as a peace um, politician. And he continued his uh, frequent use of peace talk throughout his presidency. Um, in fact, peace rather than detente became the watchword of the Nixon administration's foreign policy agenda. And uh, Raymond Gardhoff, who wrote this big fat tome on detente, um, actually said that Nixon rarely used the term detente. Um, in his annual reports to Congress, which is what I was getting at, um, the term actually does not appear once. Um, instead, these are the titles. The first one, 1970, U.S. Foreign Policy for the 1970s, A New Strategy for Peace. 71, Building for Peace. 72, The Emerging Structure of Peace. 73, Shaping a Durable Peace. And that's where it breaks off. Um, there's a pattern here, um, and it's something that he really tried to hammer home. Now, historians like Gardhoff um, were skeptical of Nixon's frequent public endorsement of peace. He thought that they masked the administration's fundamental inclination to engage in what he called hardball power politics. Rather, he felt Nixon needed to pay lip service to a politics of peace in the domestic arena because the American public, and this, this is Gardhoff's uh, assessment, was unable to understand the complex ways of the world. My point is different, though. Nixon, uh, I think, had developed a kind of realist politics of peace. Um, Gardhoff also did not pay um, any attention to the public or emotional incentives that might have prompted Nixon to implement a politics of peace. In more recent assessments of Nixon, uh, those cultural aspects have received uh, more attention. For instance, um, David Greenberg has raised the issue of Nixon's um, pacifist Quaker upbringing uh, as one factor in shaping his political career, but arguing that it basically made him into a tortured, tortured kind of uh, individual. There were also pragmatic benefits to a peace politics, which Nixon revealed candidly in this 1971 conversation with Henry uh, Kissinger. Uh, the subject of this conversation, uh, this was from the, from the tapes. Um, I actually tried to find the tapes, but it's just too unwieldy. I, it would have been great to just show you the, 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 the voices of, of the two of them. Um, they were talking about SALT one, and this was 1971. Uh, so here's the, 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 the brief version of the conversation. So Nixon, we're having it, Salt One, for political reasons. Kissinger, that's right. Nixon, because the American people are so peace-loving, they think agreements solve everything. If we can do it for political reasons, this is where I would disagree with Buckley, who wouldn't, won't understand it. If we can do this and get sort of the peace issue going with us, we, the Democrats, Kissinger, no, no, Buckley isn't against the Salt Agreement. Nixon, the Democrats, I know. But, I am, but I'm, I'm a lot more hardline than he is on this kind of thing. Once we get it in, and then, should we then survive the election? Um, it's clear here that regardless of whether Nixon was pro or anti-peace, he acknowledged that there was tremendous public pressure in favor of peace in Vietnam, as well as in favor of peace with the communist world. And he had determined that the signing of an arms reduction treaty was a politically opportune course to follow. In fact, being for peace and, and showing that he was for peace through these kinds of agreements was, he thought, something that would get him re-elected. Okay. There were other huge pressure points. Um, one uh, important one was Congress. Um, between 1968 and 1963, Congress um, uh, lowered defense spending from 8.2 billion to 7.7 .7 billion. This was with Nixon's uh, approval, of course. Uh, when adjusted for inflation, uh, this was actually a 30% um, drop in the defense budget. This reduction was the work of a broad-based peace coalition that put pressure on Congress, a coalition that included not only traditional pacifists and student activists, but also more moderate political 
uh, representatives. Um, and, and it incurred Nixon's approval. If he wanted uh, to get anything done, he had to embrace by 1971 a politics of peace. Um, so let me conclude with some uh, more general observations regarding the transformation of the concept of peace between 1945 and 73. Its earliest proponents after the war were really dreamers and idealists. They envisioned a grand new way of organizing human society uh, through uh, organizations like the United Nations, through world government, there were some who argued for that in the late 40s, through the abolition of all nuclear weapons. They were confronting a group of realist policymakers who based their analysis of international relations on thinkers like Clausewitz, Machiavelli, and other realists. But gradually, I argue, the ground shifted under these real politicians and the tables turned. What it looked like rational pragmatic policy making early in the Cold War period now looked irrational, increasingly irrational and absurd. And what had seemed like a utopian pipe dream now appeared the same solution. This is why I find the report from Iron Mountain so crucial. It's utterly pragmatic, scientific, as Lewin put it, tone betrayed the absurd conclusions it drew. Nothing epitomized the realist fetish better than the numerous think tanks and policy institutes that employed dozens of really smart eggheads, and they were really smart, who used scientific methods and complicated algorithms to calibrate the most foolproof yet absurd methods of winning the Cold War. It took the literary form of absurdism and a document like this report to expose the flaws scientific, scientific approach to international relations. It mocked policy think tanks as fundamentally irrational, the opposite of what they wanted to be. What made them irrational? What made them irrationally was that they used an irrational foundation the irrational fear of communism, the idea of the evil empire, and grafted a scientific rational policy analysis on top of it. Policymakers in the 1950s created the perfect catch-22. They had to be willing to go to war, they had to be credibly willing to go to war in order to avoid war. That's a catch-22, that's absurd. They were stuck in an impossible situation. So gradually, the dreamers of the 1950s became the pragmatic peace politicians of the 1960s. They developed a practical approach to international cooperation. Uh, they became much more realist in their argument. And they developed this practical approach to international cooperation that promised the greatest possible chance toward both peace and prosperity. However, we have to say that despite their efforts and despite the triumph of peace politics in the early 1970s, short-lived as it was, war remained a constant throughout the Cold War. Um, Mary Dusiak has made that very clear in her excellent book, Wartime. There's this interesting chart where it basically shows that war was basically present constantly during the Cold War. War is still a reality. Um, or a real threat for millions of people on the periphery of the centers of global wealth today. And violence is still a real threat for people on the economic margins of society. The correlation between war and economic and physical deprivation is now obvious, but still too many political leaders lack the resolve to act on it. Investigating a pragmatic politics, investing in a pragmatic politics of peace might provide the biggest long-term dividend, because it aligns national and international interests. Unfortunately, today, we might be farther from that understanding than we have been since the early 1960s. And in fact, I'm becoming political here. If Trump's policy promise of military increased military expenditures are any indication, we might actually be moving closer to making the report from Iron Mountain a reality than we have ever been before. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> Should I just call on people? Yes, Go ahead. Um, so I'm going to mumble through this because I'm trying to parse it in my mind. How would you, um, um, how 
would you look at maybe um, these politicians um, with World War I and World War II in the back of their minds, arms races and then appeasement, and how maybe being prepared and the threat of going to war actually kept a general war or a nuclear war at bay, and mm -hmm. that was possibly the best option for peace, the a larger peace. Y yes. Um, the problem was nuclear war. This really changed the entire calculation. Um, and this is where, I mean, in, in many ways, peace was discredited by World War II. So peace activists, those of the earlier period, really struggled to, uh, to recover. At the same time, the presence of nuclear weapons uh, was such a threat that, that people started arguing, it's like, we cannot, under any circumstances, afford another war because this one will destroy our planet. So there was no, there was no winning a nuclear war. Um, at least until Herman Kahn, you know, um, who, who Turgidson in, in Dr. Strangelove is, 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 is uh, modeled on him. Herman Kahn actually said, yeah, it's winnable. It's like, you know, we might lose 50, 60, 70 million people, 100 million, 200 million people, but we'll survive. Those who are left over, you know, they will move on. Um, they will make do, and it might actually be better for them. So, so there is this, this calculation, okay? Um, and in the, initially, the realists, those who said we need to be aggressive, they won out. This was the political orthodoxy uh, in the early post war period. Uh, and the peace uh, activists, um, and I'm not talking about sort of student activists, I'm talking mm -hmm. about, about scientists, I'm talking about um, sort of middle-aged, um, important people, people in important political positions also, um, Norman Cousins, um, 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 people who supported world government, Albert Einstein, the, the scientist, who argued we need a world government. We need something much more radical. The UN is not going to be enough. They were looked at as dreamers. And, and they were. They were idealists. Uh, and they learned over the course, and this, this is what I found in my research, over the 50s and into the 60s, they learned to talk pragmatic, in, re in realist and pragmatic terms, and make it, make it sort of politically acceptable and profitable in a way to be in favor of, of peace, um, of a peace politics. That's why I call it a peace politics. Um, something got lost about, from, about the idealism in the process. But something, something had, had to change. Um, anyway. Yes? Yeah, Petra, I really, really liked your presentation. Um, and it, you. Especially in the context of today. Um, in thinking about it, I was wondering about the sources of the peace of politics. As I understand mm -hmm. your argument, you're saying that it, that it has a basic kind of cultural source to it. And so um, I guess I have two, two questions about that. One, when you talk about the cultural sources, aren't you really talking about political elites who are changing their minds? Not the mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, if you're not, then, you know, how do you know that individuals around America uh, were saying, gee, you know, look at this nuclear war, it's really so scary, we've got to start thinking differently, and then it kind of bubbles up from mm -hmm. below mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. Those are two, diff two really different kind of models of looking at mm -hmm. how you get a politics of peace. I was wondering if you could address that. So, I, I don't want to sort of say that you know there's a source and then there's a consequence. So I don't want to make it sort of a, a causal relationship so that there are cultural sources, you know, cultural cause for this change of mind. It's sort of a it's a it's a context, it's a cultural environment that changes over time. And yes, they're not ordinary people. In fact, when I started this project, I wanted it to be straight up about about transnational 1960s um, student activists and, and sort of those contexts. And I realized they had no they're very little Contacts, uh, because they weren't wealthy enough, <laughs> um, they didn't have the networks, and it was older 
people um, who came out of you know, the interwar period, some, many of them, uh, who were the driving force uh, initially behind the anti-nuclear war, uh, anti-nuclear movement, behind the world government movement in the 1940s, um, and who also drove that kind of debate. They were intellectuals, um, they were uh, political operatives, uh, so they were not, they were not, yes, they were, they were elites, you're right, they were intellectual elites, in a way. Um, and, and it was a debate that they had in trying to make themselves understood with policymakers. Now, people like Norman Cousins, he had connections. Um, he had good connections. He wrote in the Saturday Review of Literature. He got important people to comment uh, in his um, in his um, in his journal, and so he had an impact. And it was those people that were interested. They were still politically on the margins and were still dismissed. They had they had no no impact. Um, and sort of looking at how that, sort of their rhetoric, A, changed over time, uh, how it interacted with the, with the political establishment. Um, um, and I'm looking at not just American policymaking, I'm also looking at the, at the Russians. Uh, the Russians were masters in, in co-opting the peace terminology, especially in the early, uh, in the early uh, Cold War period. I mean, immediately in 1945-47, they created the World Peace Council. So it is that kind of debate that I'm interested in. Um, but ultimately, on the American side, it is trying to understand why they moved from saying, and they said in the early 60s, they still said, peace is dangerous. It's a threat to national security. Anybody who was in favor of peace in the US was deemed either a dupe of the communists or, or a fifth columnist, okay? Um, and, and basically they were, they were saying, um, they dragged these, this, this uh, women's group, Women's Strike for Peace, in front of HUAC, uh, and in the opening statement he said, what you're doing is dangerous. You are a threat to national security. Peace, peace is a threat, he says, really said, peace is a threat to national security. Um, so, and that, something changed there in the 1960s that made this, Acceptable. Yeah, I, I agree. If I may just follow up, um, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the Soviet Union being, you know, it, it was they were very good at mm -hmm. you know, really manipulating these symbols. So um, there's a kind of international. Again, I I suppose it's my discipline, but I keep thinking of these mm -hmm. kind of terms um, that. Maybe that also had an influence on the politics of peace in the United States. Um, what the USSR said and the kind of terms that they used mm -hmm. uh, could have had some resonance here. Um, but at the very least, um, at, at what point? I mean, well, I, I say they could they could have because they're calling talking about you know disarmament and, mm -hmm. and you know especially in the sixties they were talking about this mm -hmm. all the time, especially because Khrushchev didn't have as many. Weapons as we did, so mm -hmm. you know, this became very convenient for him. But, but, um, uh, but you know, around this time, Nixon is beginning to sort of see this this idea, and then, and then the the two of them started talking at each other using some similar terminology. The two of them, you mean? The you mean, Soviet Union and the United States. Um, they and kind of reinforcing. I, I, I I'm not quite sure. Uh, this is the first time I've ever thought about this stuff, so yeah. pardon me for being kind of abstruse here, but I, I, I was... So, um, basically it was a moment when American policymakers took, started taking Soviet peace pledges seriously. So peace was always, you know, the Soviets were always for peace. Um, they coined the term um, peaceful, co you know, Khrushchev, peaceful cooperation. The American response to that was the peace offensive, which I think is a, is a hilarious term, right? So it was an attack on America. The peace, peaceful cooperation, the suggestion by Khrushchev for peaceful cooperation was a peace offensive. Uh, and Eisenhower said, we have to be cautious. We have to see what they mean by it. But there was this fundamental mistrust that when they say peace, what they mean is they want to kind of infiltrate us and we lower our defenses and then, and then we're weak. 
So peace was also a synonym for being weak. And, um, and there's a really a dramatic shift with the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay? And we could argue purely on political terms. I could, I could make this argument saying, okay, there's the, there's the Berlin Wall crisis where Americans uh, and Russians come really close to nuclear war. This prompts a lot of peace, new peace organization, peace initiatives. Then there's a Cuban Missile Crisis. And after that, Khrushchev and Kennedy say, we've got to find some other way of doing this. But I think that is not enough. There is also a push from below. There has to be sort of a cultural environment that all of a sudden makes it possible to, for the U.S. also to talk in those terms without you know, being seen as caving in, as, as being weak. And that's sort of the cultural environment, the cultural context that I want to that I want to sort of explore. And as I was sort of writing this and revising this, I thought actually of, of um, we have, do we have some millennials here? Of, of current day um, parallels. Um, the report from Iron Mountain is, is like the Steve Colbert of today. Um, it's, 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 it's the John Stewart, okay? It's people taking what these extreme sort of realists are saying and presenting to the world, like, yeah, this is what it really looks like. And isn't it funny? You know, in a way, in the beginning, it's funny, but it's also really sad, and there is this element of truth in it. And through the mode of absurdity, um, these, this, this irrationality becomes sort of becomes obvious. Um, and I, I started out looking really at absurdity. I mean, I read Camus. I looked at this like, okay, Kierkegaard. I need to kind of get a handle on this. This is, you know, for, we were talking earlier about reading outside the discipline. I didn't make it very far with Kierkegaard, but, but <laughs> Camus and Sisyphus was really kind of an eye opener for me, uh, and also sort of the looking at the at the beatniks in the 1950s. They're seen as nutty people. They're out there, but they were doing something very important. They took, you know, by by being completely outside of the realm of sort of the rational, they put up in a way a mirror and said, you know. Our insanity basically shows, you know, is, is, is a way back to, to sanity, is a way back to just think about the basics. And I see that, you know, it's on the fringes in the 50s, completely on the fringes, but I see it moving to, into the center of popular culture by, by the, the mid-1960s. And so something like Steve Heller's, like, like, like Dr. Strangelove and, and, um, and the report from Iron Mountain, is sort of this cultural sort of, you know, it's mainstream. It's, it, it was a bestseller. Is that, that helps me figure out how this public mood has changed and how Nixon, even though he doesn't want to, um, creates a policy that is actually giving peace because the people want it, because otherwise he won't get reelected. So that's, you know, regardless of how hawkish he might be, how much of a, you know, the ultimate result is that there is sort of a, a peace politics that comes out of it. Uh, and he puts sort of a realist, almost a realist stamp, stamp on it. And that's, in a way, it loses some of the idealism of peace. But to me, it's like, okay, if it gets us this time, if it gets us a break in the Cold War, I'll take it. So out of personal uh, curiosity, and, and because of you make for some really poignant anecdotes, I was wondering if you happen to have any insight as to how policymakers who were involved and actually integrated that report, how they reacted once it was exposed that it was a hoax. I should I should follow up on I, I think Galbraith, you know, dismissed it and said it in there that he, he was mis he, he did say he was misunderstood. Um, later on, uh, but I think there were many who really thought this is this is this is real. And I think even there's there's somewhere the quote from Johnson who said, you know, this shouldn't have been made public because he had no clue. <laughs> he had no clue. You know, this could have been. The speculation was that it was that it was um, um, commissioned under Kennedy, 
and that he sort of inherited it. And you know how these presidencies go. You know, there's lots of things going on, and there is these study groups, and it all seemed so real that that it and it could have been. I mean, this is the irony. It could have been because they also know, and we don't know. We don't know what other studies are still buried, you know, or were burned that actually did have. This. And because there was this real book by, by Khan on thermonuclear war, which made for some really harrowing reading. Um, the, the one quote by, by Butt Turgidson in, in Dr. Strangelove, when, when he says, oh, I don't mean we won't get our hair must, you know, but I'd say um, 50 million casualties tops, maybe, maybe 60, that's all, comes from, comes from her. It's not, we all laugh at this because it is so hilarious, but it was a real statement. Um, and that shows. Yes, that was exactly my question. Oh, whether or not there was any sense that this idea was so in the kind of cultural context that the revolution that was a hoax didn't matter, whether or not it sort of discredited it. So, so actually, let me give you a postscript. Um, a couple. One is that it was reprinted in the mid-90s, and there are today still people who believe that it was real um, on the far right. The other thing was that it was reviewed in uh, a German in, in 1970 in a German political science journal, the premier political science journal, and the guy who was given um, the, the book to review um, discussed it as a serious piece, um, and, and basically And the editor said, no, 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 no. You can't do this. You can't, you can't publish it. You have to change. So we had tried several times to change him, uh, to, to make him change the review, and he refused. And it's a review. Most you know, book reviews are like 700, 800 words. This one was like 3,000 words. They could not get him to change it, so they felt obliged to publish it. So they had a little preface in there saying, talking, this is how I know that they wanted what they wanted to do saying that he didn't understand that it was a hoax <laughs> and that they do not condone this kind of view, followed by another review by, a, by another political scientist who basically said, this is what he should have written, um, that it was a hoax. Um, so this was in the early 70s, and now you know, it's still, you see, you know, it's part of the conspiracy theories. Um, it showed up in, in JFK, in the movie JFK, as a, and, and they gave the indication I just wanted to first of all thank you very much for this excellent, fantastic lecture. I thought it was uh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And I, I want to say that I think it's very important that we remember this whole history of peacemaking over the time, especially in the current context, uh, with you know all sorts of issues going on in the United States, not just even this uh, military uh, funding increase for by Trump, but just in general, mm -hmm. kind of all this, you know, uh, kind of the influence of the military industrial in America today, which mm -hmm. is very alarming, mm -hmm. I would argue. Um, my two, I have two questions. The first is, do you think that people today are less conscious of the nuclear threat than they were back in these days? Because, for instance, there's a lot of opposition today in the United States to dialogue with Russia, and Russia still has nuclear weapons, and we still have nuclear weapons. So do you think that um, people are less conscious of that threat today? I mean, they're going to kill us, we both have that. And the second thing is, do you think that we need more absurdity uh, when talking about these issues? We need more John Stewart, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the threat of nuclear, I think it was, it, it was, it was everywhere in the early 60s. Um, that, it's not as, as immediate and as personal today anymore, even though it's still in the, you know, it's actually not about the Russians, it's about the North Koreans now, right? It's about the Iranians. Um, and this idea um, that I, Bush made this word up, like the rogue states. Um, I, I, the term to me is just, is just amazing because it just shows how much culture actually <laughs> determines sort of foreign policy. Because how do we define who is rogue and who isn't? 
It's like we define it by looking at a leader and saying, that leader is irrational, that leader is impulsive, that leader is, is dangerous, right? Um, but we apply it North Korea to uh, Ahmad Ahmadinejad to, to um, certain other leaders and not to some others who should maybe not have nuclear weapons at, at their disposal. But so, so in a way, nuclear, there, it's still nuclear, the threat of nuclear war of a nuclear attack is still very much in the news today. I think more so than it has been for a while. But it's not as immediate and as personal. Um, so we don't have, in, in the 50s you had these civil defense drills, you had Bert the Turtle, you had people in, after, the, after the Berlin Wall was built, um, you had people in the US building their own personal fallout shelters um, in, in, their back, in their backyards. Okay, so there was a real sense that, um, you know, that war, nuclear war would, could affect them. People don't have that, don't have that anymore you know, to that same degree. <coughs> So there's what I want to push a little bit. Like, it seems to me that what Kissinger and Nixon were doing were expropriating the word peace because it's, everybody's for that. Right? It's fundamental. In Western Christianity, the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, to basically focus on stabilizing nuclear deterrence, which is the Dr. Strange one business, mm -hmm. and then later on the Freeze Movement. Right? There was a concern that there was an element of think tankers who really thought that we could fight a nuclear war. Right? Mm -hmm. it now it's extremely dangerous. So they wanted to stabilize that threat, and Kissinger thought they could do it through Vietnam. But there are another group, later on become the neocons, who thought we, should, we shouldn't compromise uh, uh, because until uh, Poland was first. And for the neocons, mm -hmm. the neocons, not until every Jew in Russia, mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union, is living there. Mm -hmm. These are the issues that they weren't, they weren't against stabilizing the nuclear threat. They were against making a political peace. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, you know, George Kennedy used to write that we militarized so quickly that we thought of the Cold War in military terms rather than political terms. And I think, like in your talk, sometimes you're talking about military issues, mm -hmm. stabilizing an instrument of nuclear deterrence. And sometimes you're implying politics, very rarely, though, mm -hmm. uh, which would drive you down into what's really at stake. Who won't give up on the contest like the neocons? Mm -hmm. um, and they want to pursue the confrontation with the Soviet Union until there is no more captive people. Mm -hmm. Stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I guess, because when you got to the end, you start talking about realists. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not science. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, I the, sense the, that. the hardcore, <laughs> the hardcore uh, human rights advocates now are on the mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. not the right. Mm -hmm. The, the realists are like Trump, right? They are, uh, who gives a crap about human rights in Russia? Mm -hmm. Let's just cut a deal. You know, that's very different than the neocons. It's, it, the, I was in Russia just after the invasion of um, Crimea mm -hmm. and with a small American delegation. We met with Sergei Lavrov, who uh, carried this. And uh, I was coming home with Bob Legbold, who teaches at, at uh, Columbia Harvard. Who are the real hawks in the Obama administration? And without a doubt, it was Samantha uh, Powers and uh, Susan mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they were just absolutely unwilling to budge on anything to do with Russia for Putin. Uh, and so now you, you come here and saying, oh, the great danger is on the right and the left. And I'm sitting here as getting an old man. And you know, the world has evolved in a way. It's really complicated right now. It's the left mm -hmm. that's pushing the new Cold War largely for domestic reasons to try mm -hmm. to get after Trump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at real cost, right, they're going to reinitiate. It. It's as if the Russians were a 10-feet tall boogeyman. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the left. Mm -hmm. That's not the right. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, 
What do you mean by so, where do the politics come so, in your story so, when you talk about because I feel like you, you you focus on a symbol, piece, a word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everyone wants to expropriate it. Yes. If you go out to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, there's a big archway that you can go in for the uh, thing that says peace is our profession. That's that's <laughs> you know that's once I once I paid attention and looked at, at the movie and I, I teach Dr. Strange Love, so I now, I, I now know the movie inside out. All the references to peace, you know, they, they actually have that peace is our profession on the military base. But what I want to say is like, um, I'm, I'm a historian, and as, as a historian, I, I'm not making, I, I'm making references to the present, but I'm not saying that today it is like, it resents, there's, there's change involved. And what you were saying about everybody's for peace is exactly the starting point of my book. Is uh, is basically the central thesis. Is like here's this universal concept that everybody can rally around. Everybody does rally around. But nonetheless, we have a lot of debates, uh, and people are fighting over the term peace. Okay, and people are mangling. The concept of peace. They're politicizing it. They're using it for their own political purposes. Okay. Um, and so, even though it's a universal concept, we can, it's very malleable. We can use it for all sorts of different things. So, the Soviets used it um, in the World Peace Council. They had youth festivals that were about peace, peace. Um, peaceful cooperation. Everything was peace. The Americans first said, peace is communism, and therefore we can't have it. At the same time, they realized, hmm, we look bad in the world if we say we can't be for peace. So when you read, for instance, the speeches by all the signers of the 1949 um, NATO pact, a military pact, all they talk about is peace. Um, peace through strength, um, all these kinds. So in a way, yes, you're right. What I've tried to pick apart uh, in, in, my, in my book is to sort of look at how politicians dealt with the concept of peace. Everybody wanted, you're absolutely right, and that's part of my argument. Everybody wanted peace, but how do you get there? And, and both Soviet and American politicians uh, really subscribed to a policy of what they call peace through strength, and that meant was an Orwellian concept was war is peace. The threat of war, uh, the threat of annihilation is what guarantees us peace. That's the, the idea behind deterrence, right? That's the idea behind mutually assured destruction. It's like if we're just so serious enough that we will pulverize you, we'll have peace. Um, and, and so what I'm looking then is at the evolution of these debates about peace as they evolve from the early, from the immediate post-war period into early into the early 70s. Right? Um, and things flip, and this is the interesting thing, and I absolutely agree with you. Now it's the leftists who are the, 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 the hawks, um, who feel like Russia cannot be trusted. I was actually I was actually amazed and, and really excited, you know, when Hillary Clinton said it's like Russia is the big enemy, Russia is the big enemy. That it was really kind of a strange argument to hear from the Democrat. But, but this shows only how this terminology is, is, um, is so malleable that, in a way, by the late, this is the other part of my argument that I'm not talking about here, is that anti war activists, I make this, this short sort of hint that I see pacifists and anti war activists as different people. Anti war activists, the students, actually became military. They started condoning violence and mili you know, military, military in support of peace because they looked at the National Liberation Movement, because all of a sudden decolonization uh, and anti colonial movements came in. Franz Fanon came in and he said violence is just a given. And all of a sudden you had anti war activists saying, we've got to bring the war home. Um, and so my argument today was actually to connect that cultural context to the political debates. It was not about military, it was about how, 
how politicians, whether they want it or not, and really brought, wanted peaceful cooperation. Nixon might not have wanted it, but both met in the middle and developed what I call the policy. In that 60 to 72 period, this is my main point. Mm -hmm. You're combining two different things. Nixon was prepared to have stable detente with a, a presumption that we would be in this nuclear stalemate forever. Henry Kissinger wrote at length that it was impossible okay. to ever solve this problem. The Soviet Union was the way it is. We're mm -hmm. the way we are. We're going to have this nuclear stalemate forever, but we should try to make it as safe as possible so we don't get an accident exchange mm -hmm. and things like that. But the idea... But why did he uh, think that? But, why but, did but there he was think a second that? agenda going on. It was not... That was all military. SALT, you mentioned the, the SALT talk to the strategic army. There's a second thing, and Brock is involved with this. Brock's involved in genuine rapprochement. I'll recognize East Germany. I'll recognize the boundaries of Poland. I'll recognize the legitimacy in a very backhanded way of the government mm -hmm. in East Germany. Mm -hmm. He was ready to address the real political issues on which we were, we were in this contest with the Soviet Union. Kissinger and Nixon were not. They were trying as best they could to stop Brock from moving forward on that political front. Mm -hmm. uh, Brock, and, mm -hmm. and see, I think these are, it's important to make the distinction between this kind of military standoff that, well, OK, we'll have a tactical truce so to speak, insult the breeders, yeah. and an approach to a piece that says, we're going to change the structure, this, you know, Kennan first, and then later on Bront, yeah. eventually Gorbachev, uh, start talking about the real Well, policy. you have the Helsinki Accords in the 70s. Yeah, but the Helsinki Accords are very unpopular in the United States, right? I mean, the only parts of it, they, they stick all their human rights on the Article 8, in there, and it was a hugely negotiated thing that everybody agreed to just ignore mm -hmm. because what the Americans cared about was salt. Well, and we gave the Russians Helsinki um, in okay. exchange. Here's where I, uh, I see your and point. We tried to I, I think I understand your point. The U.S. politically tried to keep yeah. everything of meaning that Brock wanted in Helsinki that is a recognition of the current status quo, which mm -hmm. the Soviet Union wanted uh, out. I, I mean, I, I understand your argument. I disagree with you that you can separate politics from the military as neatly as you want to. I don't think that's possible. I think you need to treat them because they're together, they're, but as somewhat. Uh, you just, I think when you put them all in the same stew, it just gets confusing. Do you hear that? <laughs> um, they are in the same stew. I don't think that military agreements were that separate from political. That they they were intertwined. Sure. Um, that what what you are then not not seeing is that along with those military agreements, actually preceding the military agreements, there were already a lot of trade agreements um, with the um, with the Eastern Bloc, and that started actually already under Johnson. Something I didn't I didn't talk about because I wanted to keep things a little neater, not me, not for you, <laughs> but but. Um, so those things all played, played into each other. And so I don't want to actually separate just a purely military solution from a, from a political one, because I think that they intertwine and, and they, um, they affected each other. And I don't think that Nixon, that Nixon and, and Kissinger separated them as neatly um, as, as, as you want to. And, and maybe it's also, Everyone I'm looking at more them. I don't, I don't want to label them as the same thing. And I, I might also be looking at it more from a from an international perspective because I look also at the time how it played out in in Europe, in the, not just Germany, but in Europe in the nineteen seventies. And you do have a real push toward opening up this there's real increase in trade and there's lots and lots of political agreements that the US was also part of. One part of the off politic um, was actually an agreement a core power agreement on, on Berlin um, that that West Germany was not really part of, uh, but it was still part of that off politics. So the U.S. was very much part of that agreement. Um, and so there you have the political element of the talk. It was not just. That's um, coming too. And then I think the Helsinki negotiation, Helsinki reports were also very, very Loosening up that, that cold war. Um, 
interject some, uh, some politics of peace in this exchange and uh, <laughs> ask you all to join with me once again in thanking <laughs>